Hi there, and welcome again to Peninsula Players Presents, and uh, another in our series of our Peninsula Players history. Today, uh, we're going to start in 1940. We left our last interview at the end of 1939, when Rodian Rathbone enlisted in the Canadian Air Force, and Britain declared war on Germany. So we're going to pick up right there. So Audie, we hi. have Audra back with us. Hi there. Uh, hi. <laughs> um, so between uh, the end of um, 1939 and the beginning of the 1940 season, what was going on? Well, Rodian was tr in flight school. So he had enlisted in the Canadian Royal Air Force and he was in training to become a pilot. Mm -hmm. So Caroline was a little more focused with that, but she was still also focused on the theater. So um, within the United States, they're aware of things going on in Britain and some things in, and in Europe and things are starting to um, take shape. And Caroline is aware of that and has some plans for the season of... Um, setting up the uh, coffee for intermission. So the uh, Jane Bookbinder, who was the next door neighbor's daughter, is in charge of that for the entire season, is selling coffee at intermission and all of the proceeds are gonna go to the American Red Cross for relief. Well, but before she sets this up uh, with the bookbinders, mm -hmm. um, there were some improvements? There was, and that they, and some weren't from the players instigated, but the road from Highway 42 down to Peninsula Players was paved. And that was big news for uh, patrons who were going to be using that road. Mm -hmm. And also they got a new front curtain. So a blue and gold trim front curtain for the performance space. Oh, so nice. That they put in. Yes. And uh, and then the company came, they arrived by train. They arrived by train. And I think this is now the 1940s, their fifth season. And they've really gotten a lot of good press and good reviews from patrons across not just the Green Bay area, but extending beyond the Green Bay area into Chicago and other regions and all of the people who come to visit Door County. So they've got quite a, quite a, a, a reach for this audience. And it is news when the company arrives by train and Caroline goes to meet them in her car to drive them the rest of the way up to Door County. So they're at the Green Bay train station and Margo's coming in and Gertrude Needham from um, California, I believe, and Richard Angernoel and Jean Sincere coming up maybe from Chicago and as well as New York. I believe Jean was in New York. So coast to coast, they're coming to Peninsula Players to perform for that season. And also expected to arrive within a few weeks again is Jacqueline Wells, who we talked about in the last episode, who's out in Hollywood filming. Mm -hmm. So she's in the headlines. And oh, and yes. But uh, in, in a second, uh, and you had mentioned the book binders that also Caroline set up this um, coffee. The coffee, yes. The intermission coffee for the first time. And, uh -huh. and the, also all of the Wharf Theater was still presenting. So the students that um, were part of the program were going to be presenting shows on Sundays. And the before the show was going to be included in the ticket price, a buffet supper. So the audience of the Wharf Theater could have dinner in the lodge. And then and this isn't the, the regular theater. This is the smaller Wharf right, Theater. Right, it's the Wharf Theater. So it has a smaller seating capacity. And then all of the proceeds from those events were going to also go to the Red Cross. For and also uh, during that season with the bookbinders, Caroline set up a knitting circle, right? Yes, that is correct. Her and Mrs. Bookbinder uh, put a call out for volunteer ladies or anybody who knew how to knit that they were going to meet Wednesday afternoons at the bookbinders home, which is just the next property um, next to the theater. And the they were going to, yep. And the only requirement was that you knit a garment, mm -hmm. just be able to provide something to send overseas and uh, and that home where barbara and larry goldberg now live is a quite interesting house it is i remember a lot of patrons would ask is that designed by frank lloyd wright and i'd have to go no it, but it sure is that style that 
Right. Yeah, I believe they were uh, actually, I, I'm going to say students of Frank mm -hmm. Wright. It was a firm called Keck and Keck. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So uh, we get into the beginning of the actual season. And they're opening on the 4th of July. Which we've done before. Which we have, yes, we have done before. And they've kind of made it an event. So in addition to all of the other firsts, so it's July 4th. And they start the day by participating in the 4th of July parade in Bailey's Harbor for the first time. So having been in that parade for as many years as I have, I now have a start date <laughs> as to how long we've been participating in the parade. So. Yes. Quite a while. Kind of exciting. And just knowing everything that has to go into the opening night of the season. So they started the day um, parading in the 4th of July. They were setting up to greet guests because they invite people for an opening night reception, as we do and continue to do. And mm -hmm. then they went on to perform Hay Fever. And they before opening curtain, they played the Star Spangled Banner which, you know, that's a very patriotic thing for them to do. Mm -hmm. But even before that, um, Jacqueline Wells was supposed to be, play the lead, Sorrel Bliss, in the play, but Hollywood couldn't release her. So she was still tied up doing films, so Margot Fisher had to step in and take over for Jacqueline's parts for the first two shows. The first two, yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. So... And those things were all exciting. So people are coming down now on a paved road um, <laughs> down to the theater. How so, civilized. Oh, yes. With a new front curtain and intermission yeah, yeah. coffee. So uh, we opened the season July 4th. And uh, now that season, I believe there were 10 shows altogether. I think so. At least on the main stage. I know there. it's hard to keep track because... Some of them did flip around and there was a couple double build so that they were performing in the same evening. But and basically, basically each show ran for a week. Ran for a week. They had a, it, it was there for a week. So they opened on a Thursday and it generally performed till a Sunday. And then uh, once then it would they switch opened, over. they would start the next, working on the next show. Then they'd start working on the next one. So they usually had about four days to rehearse, depending on who's in the show. So yeah. mm -hmm. I did one season of Summer Stock on Cape Cod in Chatham, where we did eight shows, one a week. And when I think about it now, about how we learned all those lines right. in a week, um, all I can say is that we were younger. Right. Well, and then one of the company members, James Lut Lut Lutberg, who was also in the shows, was directing all of the student productions for the Wharf Theater. So, and and they were also uh, a company of students. Um, as well so there was 15 students so they're building the costumes with under uh, mama fisher's supervision and they're building the scenery and they're rehearsing these shows and learning their lines and working in the box office and ushering and doing some of the things that all of our um, interns also do when they're with us at this time so there's the apprentices moving and, and doing all of this actors learning their lines and they're just staying very very busy uh, so we opened the uh, the second show that was a week later, July eleventh, the plays the thing. The plays the and thing, that and that group. went over very well. So, and to those very end was uh, the reviewer said, you know, the plays the thing is this week the players entertain with a capital E, and I, so it was it did it made, made me giggle because looking at some of the other shows in the season, it was like, oh, here's the comedy, here's the entertainment, and then we're going to also present a four hundred year old Renaissance comedy that supposedly has never been performed in the United States before. <laughs> so. La Mandragola <laughs> by Machiavelli. Machiavelli. So, and the, yes. So, it, and that's how it was built. Never performed in the United States before. So, oh, wow. wow. So, you know, their intention of not only doing new works and Richard writing new works, but also bringing in world premieres. Which, mm -hmm. see, and then, uh, and speaking of Richard, the next show is one, I believe, he wrote. He did. He wrote one for his sister, Margot, and it was based off of the myth of the water fairy and had some ballet within there because Margot was a trained dancer. So she had some routines in there. And 
um, setup of, I remember reading the review of more than 100 light cues for this production oh because they were trying to do underwater dance sequences within it. So trying to make Margot look like she was floating and underwater and casting different reflections. And for 1940, that's very ambitious. Well, to... for even today, 100 light <laughs> cues is ambitious, so... especially when you think about back then, the lighting equipment and the controls were m much more primitive than they right. are today. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, it's not computerized. It's all hand manipulated or backstage with a dimmer switch yeah. going up and down. And when I just... started at the theater in 88, I believe that some of those big dimmers were still backstage. Still backstage there. OK. Hmm? Yeah. yeah. Hmm? But they, oh. they weren't being used. <laughs> and then uh, the, so Undine opened uh, around July 25th. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of that at the room. end of at the end of July, there was a little rescheduling that needed to happen because Caroline was having some pains, and Doctor Bookbinder, the next door neighbor, is a doctor, and he was telling her, "You need to have your appendix taken out." And she's like, "No, I can I can hold off. I can wait till the end of the season. It's okay, you know." And it it didn't. It flared up, and at the end of July, Doctor Bookbinder rushes Caroline to Chicago for an emergency appendect appendectomy. Because again, I can't pronounce things. <laughs> so. Well, you're not a doctor. No, I'm not a doctor. So she had to go off and they were supposed to do Wuthering Heights, which is the one show Caroline was going to be in that season. And mm -hmm. they had to postpone it because now she's in recovery from her emergency surgery. So they did a little and, switching around again there too. And mm -hmm. so the, instead they did, what did they do next? I believe the it was hat? the Italian straw hat, right? Which is a comedy and, and a farce. And Leo Lucker played a bridegroom who gets into all sorts of trouble after his horse eats a lady's straw hat. So, it just, Sounds very deep. Very, right. But it was a wonderful segue into what they did next. Which was, yes. <laughs> the double build, billing of the comedy of rogues and Oedipus Rex by Sophocles. Now, a, a typical double billing that everyone does. <laughs> right. So, tell us about both of those. Oh, A Comedy of Rogues was written by um, Helen Bragdon, a member of the company. So it was supposed to be a little light comedy to kind of counterweight Oedipus, but within the same time structure. And then Oedipus, and then there's Oedipus. So it's it, Oedipus is what Oedipus is and right. but Oedipus it, it you know Sophocles. but they did really well they got really great reviews and you know it's amazing that the patrons could they were appreciative of all of the works that they did there's some things that you know maybe didn't quite hit the mark but they appreciated the efforts that were put in by the cast yeah. by Leo and Helen Bragdon and the newcomer Richard Angelero, who played the king and and quite an ambitious double bill there right? it was and and they did eventually um and then also put on the um oh i can't remember what else was there so um, and then and then after that i believe was weathering Heights. then they put on weathering heights and i had read an art and this was adapted by richard for the stage mm -hmm. so he wanted to feed he was really good at featuring his sisters and finding their talents and putting them in so caroline was going to be kathy in weathering heights and they delayed it because of her surgery but the night they went to rehearse before opening night it's rumored that they realized richard realized the show ran for four hours and that was a little too long <laughs> so, so he went back in at overnight and like rewrote the last act so it was shorter and then they rehearsed that that day and then opened the show that night and supposedly it would the audience loved it so much that when they went to close the season and do their final performance they redid a performance of weathering heights because they couldn't get everybody in to see it that wanted to see it so oh, wow a great right. romantic story there. It's, yes, it and is. And we find that Weathering Heights comes back a little bit it later. It does a little, bit, a little later. bit later. Yes, again, exactly. So there's just some exciting things that, you know, they did their review. They, um, 
did their review was called We Shudder to Think. And so they had their commentaries and Margot did a dance routine and Jean Sincere, who was a member of the student company, she's also a singer. And so she performed several songs for that because this was the only opportunity to present vocal talent mm -hmm. in that respect because the company wasn't doing musicals. So... <laughs> And then after that, I believe we end with a show called Personal Appearance. In which Margot Margo was featured, and that closed out on the holiday weekend at that point in time. Yes. So, yeah, Labor Day weekend. Labor Day weekend, yes. And being an outdoor venue in Wisconsin, they were starting to learn that there are cold snaps that come through. And in August, audience members were seen wearing fur coats and their winter clothes because it was just a little too cold. Um, one local reporter commented that it was below the below 50s. So high to low for mid 40s outdoors and real wintry kind yeah. of weather. So it's crazy. Well, it's always been crazy. I remember uh, summers when it was cold through the month of June, and we had to put the heat on and the, the radiant heating in the floor. On right, exactly. They didn't have that. Did they, they no, they didn't, and so that was that was yeah. The, they're kind of dealing with that one. So, and it was still out in the open. And it was still out in the open, but you know, doing the five shows wasn't the only thing that Caroline and Richard did that summer. They mm -hmm. were true lovers of the arts, and for most of the time for pre-show music, Richard would have on um, classical music playing for a pre-show. Mm -hmm. And they appreciated the arts so much that they invited a trio of musicians from Chicago to come up and perform. And it was a chamber orchestra called at the time, the Russian trio. And I know as the years go by, they changed their name because of World War II. They didn't want to be associated as just Russian, but they right. were very talented musicians from the Chicago area. And yeah. um, I sent you a link um, about the cellist. It, oh, did you yes. get a chance to look at that? Uh, amazing. Ennio Bolognini. And uh, it's, uh, it's so fascinating because he came from Argentina, yes. where he was the weatherweight boxing champion there. And he ended up moving to Chicago and becoming this, uh, an amazing cellist. And uh, who's godfather was arturo toscanini yes. yeah okay. and it was just amazing and then they and both he and the other members played with the chicago symphony for a very long time and, yes. and that was uh, hans moinzer and uh, nina mesero minchin mm -hmm. who were uh, extraordinary musicians of that time of that time and so here it's 1940 and audiences in dark county are getting oedipus rex italian farces italian comedies and chamber music and just this nice classic classical arts uh, being presented <laughs> which you will find as we go ahead uh continued in upcoming years yes. uh, with them featuring classical music. Yes. Which, uh, I, I just, I think that's just amazing. <laughs> I love that. And then, uh, and that also during that time, uh, Caroline, uh, during this season was speaking to Rotary Clubs. She was, and she'd go about and give presentations on Peninsula Players and introduce, introduce them. And one of the things she shared with them is that in Wisconsin alone, Peninsula Players was one of, was the first summer professional summer, summer theater. But within the five years of that time, a few more started springing up. So there was this real movement of even across the country, when you look at theater history mm -hmm. of the summer theater movement and other theater projects starting. So it, it was starting to gain momentum. And as I kind of started out um, the 1940 season, they had a huge quarter page ad in the Green Bay Press Gazette promoting their season with photos and just really promoting the arts and, and for people to come up and to see all of this. and. Um, and some of the 1940 company members were very interesting. You've mentioned some of them. Um, I know I'm trying to get back to my list, but yes, there was Richard 
Arganello, whose father was a painter and associated with the Chicago Arts Institute where he was teaching. And his mother was a, a, a pianist with the symphony as well. And he was a soloist with the symphony before he even came to Peninsula Players. Before he became an actor. Before he became an actor. So oh he was a, also a trained singer. And Gene Sincere returned and Gertrude Needham and Maggie Magerstadt came back and Leo Lucker was with was with them again and the Fisher family Dan and Dan Scott was a student in the student program and he came from California uh, to come out that season and um, he and he and Gene Sincere were featured in one of the Wharf productions called White Cargo so that was one of the productions they did in the theater or in the uh -huh. small small space in the wharf theater and uh, uh did dan go on and do other things he did when we get into future seasons we're gonna learn that dan is one of those that also changed his name so he, he became dan simon scott so you can see him in films and television as simon scott and then i think he comes back to the players as simon scott so he's one of those name switches but he had a very lucrative career in as a, a television character actor for several several decades. So the 1940 season of Summer Plays comes to an end. Comes to an end, but the Peninsula Players season does not. Ah. So this is a time frame when Wuthering Heights seemed to do so well that Richard and Caroline decided, let's tour. So they saved the scenery and the sets that Mama Fisher had worked on, and they decide to tour Wuthering Heights. Mm -hmm. And they get all they get it together, they rehearse, and they have it scheduled. And their first tour date is in Sturgeon Bay. Mm -hmm. And it's at the high school auditorium. And when they get there to set up, they realize the set doesn't fit. So <laughs> They do their best. They adapt as they can, as best they can, and they present Wuthering Heights um, in Sturgeon Bay. And right before they left on tour as well, Richard Arganello breaks his arm oh. and is in a cast. So he's, this is the beginning of December, end of November. And so he, I guess they get a, re a removable cast for him. And he take, wears it during the day and then for the performance takes it off and then Ooh. puts it back on. That's the rumor. And doesn't sound safe. Doesn't sound safe, but that's, that's what I read he did for these. And then the next week, they, they also perform in Green Bay. They travel to the Green Bay Orpheum Theater and they're to do performances there. But one of them gets canceled because of the weather. There's a snowstorm. And... Um, they perform there as well. And then they travel to uh, Wausau and do a performance in Wausau, Wisconsin at the Grand Opera House. And that's pretty well received, but the Grand Opera House is having some of their own issues in just attendance wise. And this mm -hmm. could probably be the situation across the country with, with things going on in Europe and tension and everything that maybe people aren't attending as much as they should. So it, the producers of the Grand Opera House are trying to encourage people to attend shows mm -hmm. or they can't continue to bring in touring groups. Right. And then they also perform in um, Chippewa Falls. And there's a, a lovely sh you know, shot of them on tour where Caroline's names, name is up in lights in a marquee. And it's really neat to see, you know, Wuthering Heights presented by Peninsula Players and Caroline Fisher's name up in lights. It's kind of exciting. So, so they got they're, around, did they go out of state at all or? They had hoped to, it was in the press release at the beginning of this adventure that they were hoping to get to Iowa and Illinois or Michigan or other, other states to tour. But I think the combination of when you go on tour and, and I don't know if you've, if you've been on a tour Greg. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, yeah. And, and while I was in college, I was the stage manager greeting in touring companies and helping them get set up. So not every set fits every theater. Right. And, and people watching this may not know that you, you know, each space is different. The depth of the stage, the width of the stage, the height, it's not uniform. And oh, yeah. so that's, I think what they learn 
through their efforts that things didn't so but they did the best that they could and yeah. and they were well received and got peninsula players name spread around but do we between, have any idea how they uh traveled was this a, a i think all by car and maybe a truck but i uh -huh. don't yeah there's no documentation that i'm aware of other than the playbill hmm? Yes. And of course, as you have in the past, we're always asking for people who have any um, history notes uh, with which you can fill in some of this. We're always, Audie is always happy to oh, get them. Yes, exactly. I'd love to fill in the little gaps and and so forth, or if anybody even saw them. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. You know, they were out there and they did student matinee performances. They were supposed to do a, a student matinee. And that was one of the performances that got canceled in Green Bay was, was for that. But the student productions as well in Sturgeon Bay were also, I believe, fundraisers. Um, Richard had agreed to do one as a fundraiser where the proceeds would then go for lighting equipment for the school. So the oh, players weren't keeping the benefits of that when they were giving back to the local arts community. And so. I remember uh, speaking of, of that kind of outreach stuff, uh, I know we had mentioned that Caroline spoke to the Rotary Clubs. Uh, and where was that and what did she talk about? Um, the, she was in, I believe, Green Bay at the Union Hotel um, addressing the Rotary Club. And as I mentioned, I, what got me off was the, the growth of summer theaters in the state of Wisconsin. And mm -hmm. she also talked about the day-to-day -day routine that the company members have on property. So in addition to the routine of, you know, get up, get up at in the morning at 7 a.m. and start rehearsing your script and then, you know, helping to build the scenery and the costumes throughout the day. And then Thursday night's opening night and you keep rehearsing during the day for performance Friday night and continue to move on. And it's a whole process of just being immersed in what you're doing and then learning as well from the veterans around you and their experiences. Yeah. And what's amazing to me is that a lot of the works that they did were adaptations or new works by company members and they were constantly tweaking them up until performance right up right up until there exactly so richard was you know he in addition to helping you know he paint the scenery and weed the garden occasionally and um, put in some flowers and with the property and directing he was a really hands-on artisan and mm -hmm. had that real specific quality he wanted to present. So yes, and he was also touring in Wuthering Heights. So he was also an actor, mm -hmm. but Richard didn't want to be all over a playbill, you know, like we have your name. So Richard was the producer, director, writer, adapter of Wuthering Heights. So he <laughs> didn't want to have his name also listed in the playbill as a performer. So he came up with a pseudonym and used the name William Congreve. And someone had asked the, a member of the cast after a performance in Green Bay, uh, is there really someone named William Congreve? And the reply was, well, yes, in the 12th century. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, William Congreve was a restoration playwright. Was for, for, yes. <laughs> comedies. So, yeah. so it was part of Richard's humor, sense of humor. And well, and his literacy, and too. His, right. He just, he, nope, I, my name's enough up at the top. They didn't need to see that as the performance, too. But he was, he was one of the members on tour, as was Dan uh, Simon and yeah. Richard Arganello. Uh, quite quite the renaissance people they really were and it, just fascinating and with their interests and everything that appealed to them from classical music to contemporary art and yeah so they got through the they finished the season they, they finished, did a tour of they weathering finished Heights. The tour, but they weren't done yet they no. they had they got up to christmas and what they uh foster's music company in green bay hired Richard Arganello, Caroline Fisher, Richard Fisher, and Leo Lucker to help customers pick out their music selections for holiday gifts. Nice. And this really cements that 
okay, playing the classical music and uh, Leo was a, st an op a study of opera student. He studied opera. And so they had these affiliations with the arts that were beyond just theater. And this was recognized by this music store who hired them to come in for two weeks and promote members of the Peninsula Players Company to be there for their patrons to help them pick out their music. Wow, a nice way to end the year. It was a nice way to end the year and with a little holiday cheer. <laughs> so with that, that brings us to up to 1941, which is, of course, uh, the beginning for the United States of the war years. So in our next installment, that's where we'll, we will be beginning. We will pick up from there. And we'll see you then. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.